Okay, welcome everyone to this final piece of what is algebraic geometry. And yeah, so final piece means I'm moving on with other algebraic geometry, um, more precisely tropical geometry, which is like combinat should have been called combinatorial algebraic geometry. Um, but it's kind of a very different perspective, not a very different perspective, but a different perspective compared to uh, what we're doing right now. So I will just give it a new playlist, but um, kind of put it in here as well. So next steps, like what I would call modern algebraic geometry. Uh, so really modern algebraic geometry, what we've seen right now is like modern algebraic geometry. So next step, as I said, tropical geometry. But just to wrap up, I should explain what chief cohomology is, or I would like to explain what chief cohomology is, and I will do it um, in analogy to topology. So if you haven't seen the definition of cohomology or homology, uh, I, know, I usually never say the call homology in topology. Um, it's essentially the same, but if you've never seen it, it's probably better to start with the one in homology. It's somehow more explicit and less abstract. Although in all of reality, it's really, really, really almost the same. And the point I'm going to try to make in this video is that this is really the same and there's some so much analogy and it essentially was developed. So people were computing Betty numbers. Um, or analogs of Euler characteristic and so on for varieties and then eventually they realized it comes from a type of homology theory um, on on varieties and yeah it runs in complete parallel to, in parallel to uh, topology so in topology for example now the homology of the sphere is whatever is written here um, the only thing is that I turn it around here's the d sphere and here's the n sphere but anyway, um, so I can just write that as a polynomial and I will always just write homology as a polynomial, which is a bit of an oversimplification. But essentially, uh, the coefficient is a dimension and the power of the variable, the, so the index of the variable is kind of the index in the homology, right? So here it's concentrated in two degrees, so it's one plus t to the n. But the only difference is that I swapped n and d. But anyway, so one plus t to the n. And yeah, what is... What is the analog of the sphere in algebraic geometry? Well, the analog of the sphere is the projective space. Huh? So whatever kind of homology we're trying to cook up, the homology of projective space look should look very similar, and that, that's essentially almost true. Um, it gets a bit more complicated, so the homology of this twisting on projective space is concentrated in two degrees, and in one degree it's a polynomial ring, and then the other degree it's a normal polynomial ring, essentially. But yeah, in this sense, um, the homology, which I will going to define later on, it is really the same, essentially the same idea in topology and algebraic geometry. And not just in this sense, it's just, it's just almost the same anyway. So for example, when you compute the homology of manifolds, manifolds are arguably the most important class of topological spaces, they have an associated dimension. And if you compute it for an n-dimensional manifold, um, then it's concentrated in degrees 0 to n, or in other words, the associated polynomial is just a0 up to a n, right? A 2 times c to the n. So the homology of an n dimensional variety should also just be kind of the same. It should be concentrated in certain degrees, and yeah, it is, um, at least for large classes of varieties, or the most interesting varieties like projective. For F1 varieties, it's even more boring, but for projective varieties, it's exactly what it is. So somehow projective varieties play the analog of manifolds. And yeah, that's exactly how it should be in some sense. So the striking analogy between topology and algebraic geometry is like really the same. So sphere, projective space, uh, manifold, projective varieties, essentially the analogy that you should keep in mind. And the homology is kind of was designed to be correct, if you want. And yeah, something I think is really, really nice is, and kind of fits to this description of the history of the subject. Uh, the genus usually, well, defined as the dimension of the first homology group, so A1 in my notation, just the coefficient A1. And that works like really well. So the genus should be the number of holes. And it's kind of a rigorous definition of what a hole is. So whatever. A sphere has no holes, and indeed the sphere A1 is zero, and for a torus has one hole. Uh, so, it, well, the torus would be one plus t 
2 times t plus 1 times t squared. So in order to, well, make this work in the sense of genus, you kind of need to divide this thing by 2, but let's ignore that. So, so somehow a1 will capture um, the genus, whether you divide it by 2 or not, that's kind of a matter of taste. But in order to capture it in the sense of this picture up here, so the next one is a teapot and then the pretzel or whatever, uh, yeah, whatever, divided by 2. So torus is always a binomial coefficient, so 1, 2, 1. And yeah, the genus of a plane curve, which people discovered um, because of much earlier, because a plane curve is, let's say, a complex variety, that's that's a manifold, so it should be that, exactly that genus. Uh, so it should be again a1 or a1 over 2, depends a bit how you count. And yeah, that's indeed, that's indeed the case. So the genus of a curve that you might have seen appearing differently, it might have defined differently, there are very various different definitions, again, works out perfectly, it's the dimension of the first homology group. And again, don't worry about whether you call this a genus or twice the number of the genus, it's the same information, uh, anyway, in some sense. And kind of using, in this case, using the structure sheaf. So the definition is also almost the same. So this is how it works. So it's called cohomology because it goes upwards, but don't worry about that. So we have a sheaf on the variety and we fix an open cover. N nothing else I'm going to say really then in the end depends on the open cover. But for the definition, you just fix an open cover. You evaluate the sheaf on this open cover and then take the sum of all the intersections up to a certain point. And these are the cold chain groups. And then there's a differential which essentially forgets and uh, leaves out an index or adds an index exactly like uh, you would do it for homology or cohomology. I'm not go to, going to write down the formula. The formula always looks nasty, but essentially it just forgets one of those and or adds it um, or it's a trivial one. But anyway, so that's then the differential and the cohomology is the kernel, not the image as uh, exactly as in topology. There's essentially no difference at all. If you really look at this, there's, there's almost no difference. You can almost do exactly the same thing. And then you go on and prove, okay, it's actually d squared is zero, so you can make sense of kernel modulo image, and it's independent of the choice of the cover. And more importantly, it's an invariant of sheaves, and it's reasonably not super difficult to compute. It's reasonably easy to compute, so it's really much like homology um, as a concept. And it's still a bit nasty to compute. Uh, what is a bit nicer to compute is the Euler characteristic, which is exactly like in, uh, in topology. The Euler characteristic is the alternating sum of the a's in my notation. So whatever, Euler characteristic of the cube, it has 8 here, 12 here, 6 here, you can define that as an alternating sum of the a's or the alternating dimensions of the chain complex, so the size of the chain complexes, and it comes out as the same, and the Euler characteristic, and here should be exactly the same, and yes, indeed it is, and it's kind of additive on exact sequences, which makes it a bit nicer, and you can just um, nicely compute it. When I stole this picture from Wikipedia, I'm not quite sure what they want to do here, because uh, in dimension one, they just count the number of vertices and they claim there is no edge, but apparently there is an edge. So I'm not quite sure what this picture is supposed to do, but otherwise it works very well. So like four vertices, four edges, or like actually six, zero. Uh, next one, whatever, eight vertices, 12 edges, six faces for the cube, or like actually six, two. So it's a nice invariant, it's the same type of space as a tetrahedron, or like actually six, two. And you can do exactly the same in algebraic geometry and the upshot is also exactly the same so it all our characteristic is somewhat much easier to compute the normology and it's still kind of okayish is an invariant and here's the same um the other characteristic of a of a, of a sheaf is fairly easy to compute and it does already a quite a good job to distinguishing at least kind of the standard type um, of sheaves but anyway so algebraic geometry from the very start ran pretty much in parallel with complex analysis and later on, it's kind of kind of interesting, so the very first things are more like complex analysis, and later on it kind of gets to, kind of looks like it's very similar to algebraic um, topology, in particular in descriptions like, um, like homology here. And like the functor formalism from one and the other, they look very similar, and development of categorical algebra 
kind of goes uh, hand in hand with both of them. Anyway, as I said, next time we jump to tropical geometry. But for this time, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.